everyone, and welcome to the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. This is Kelly Wamsley here, and I'm joined with Victor Hatchinger. And um, he has uh, some really interesting data that we're going to talk about today in some of his recent work. Just finished your master's at Purdue University under Dr. Adiola, right? Yep, that's right. Perfect. And um, getting ready to take the big leap into starting your PhD. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Um, lots of hard work, but definitely worth it um, in the end. So um, so before we get into the research, let's get to know you a little bit. OK, Victor? All right. OK, so I'm going to go. You're going to I'm going to say this or this and you're going to tell me which one you prefer. All right. All right. Good. OK, idle or window seat? Window Fried or grilled chicken? A grilled. Mountain or beach? Beach. Bigfoot or Yeti? Yeti. All right. Well, you kind of had a question with that, but I mean, I, I agree with Yeti. I mean, come on. Yeti's pretty cool. Okay, so Victor, today we're going to talk about some of the work that you've been doing on digestible phosphorus. But before we get into that, let's um, kind of discuss for a moment What's so important about digestible phosphorus and why do we um, why do we care about it? establishing values for different ingredients and looking into this area? All right. All right. Well, so uh, we know diet is the most uh, cost uh, contributing factor in broiler diets and uh, phosphorus contributes is the third most expensive nutrient. Uh, and so we want to increase the efficiency of dietary phosphorus. Uh, and uh, before, back in the day, we used to use total phosphorus, and then we moved toward uh, using non-phytate phosphorus, uh, which some definitions consider uh, the same as available phosphorus. But uh, uh, more recently, I would say since the 90s, we figured out that some of the phytate phosphorus can be used by the broilers, can be digested, uh, and also the non-phytate phosphorus part uh, has different digestibility to the animals. And so just using non-phytate phosphorus is less accurate to the amount of phosphorus that the animals will be able to use than uh, using digestible phosphorus. And so that's why we're seeing this move toward using digestible phosphorus uh, as well as digestible calcium uh, for ingredients. Yeah, and so the idea is we're just getting more specific, right? We're looking at trying to reduce the output of the birds in wasted nutrients and then also trying to prevent, you know, the environmental concerns um, that can be associated with excess nutrients, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, when we're overfeeding phosphorus, as uh, generally we see a safety margin in practical diets, uh, but that can lead to increased cost and also this uh, phytate phosphorus that uh, is undigested in, in excess can lead to an increased environmental uh, impact from the production. Right. So there are different ways that you can um, look for digestibility, right? There's true and there's standardized um, methods. Um, can you walk us through that a little bit and the difference and maybe the pros and cons between them? Sure. Uh, so similar to uh, what we see in amino acids, we have standardized and true. Uh, and that's because if we just analyze the digestibility of uh, the ingredient, that contains also some uh, phosphorus that is being excreted from the animal from their endogenous uh, secretions. And so when we feed a diet that is uh, free of phosphorus, uh, we can account for these losses. Uh, and so uh, these phosphorus that is excreted from these animals feed the diet devoid of phosphorus, that will be uh, in, called basal endogenous losses, which are uh, diet independent. And uh, they comprise mainly of uh, bile secretions that contain a lot of phospholipids, also mucus, uh, remnants of enzymes, loud cells. Uh, and so that that is phosphorus that doesn't come from the ingredient. And so when we have a standardized uh, phosphorus digestibility, we have a a uh, diet that all the phosphorus comes from the test ingredient and another diet where we don't have any phosphorus. Uh, and so when we co correct the digestibility for the test ingredient for these losses, uh, 
we have uh, these correction and so it's called standardized. Uh, whereas in true uh, digestibility of phosphorus, we account for also specific losses and endogenous uh, basal losses. And these specific losses are basically losses that uh, phosphorus that is increasingly excreted with uh, higher inclusion rates of the test ingredient. And so, for example, uh, it's been shown that increase in dietary phytate can lead to increased secretion of mucin, which contains some phosphorus. Uh, and so the way we calculate this through uh, phosphorus digestibility is uh, by doing a regression analysis using the total phosphorus intake as our uh, explanatory variable and the uh, digestible phosphorus intake as our uh, response variable. Uh, and so when we do these studies, we have three or more levels of inclusion of our test ingredient. Uh, <clears throat> and then we use this total phosphorus intake and digestible phosphorus intake to have a regression analysis. And then the slope will indicate uh, how much of digestible phosphorus intake increases with one unit increase in total phosphorus intake. So uh, it represents the phosphorus digestibility in the ingredient. Uh, <clears throat> And so we, uh, this digestibility, because it encompasses both the basal endogenous losses and specific losses, uh, it is more accurate of the phosphorus that pro is provided by the ingredient than, uh, let's say, standardized or apparent digestibility of phosphorus. Gotcha. And so when someone's looking at this type of research, they may, you know, look at some of the formulations that you use and think, man, this, this just isn't commercially applicable. Um, because they're not a standardized type uh, or a, a commercial standardized type diet. Um, but that's by design, right? Right. So uh, basically in these studies, we try to uh, have most of the phosphorus, if not all, uh, coming from our test ingredient. Uh, and so that's why you see a lot of uh, cornstarch, dextrose, uh, sometimes a protein source like dried egg albumin or casein. Uh, <clears throat> But sometimes, uh, for example, uh, in diets with soybean meal, we can we use concentrations of about uh, from 30 to 60 percent uh, range, and so our prediction of the regression is uh, better within that range, which uh, <clears throat> is more uh, reflective of what is used uh, practically. Sure, and so. Um you looked in your in your research so far. You've been looking at um, phosphorus digestibility in poultry meal and in soybean meal, right? Yes, that's right. And so, um, is there some type of um, cost savings that you could put your put a penny to or something a, a pencil to to calculate what you're able to um, to potentially save on a larger scale? Um, with getting that more exact with your phosphorus digestibility numbers from ingredients like that? Uh, I think so, because uh, when we look at uh, soybean meal, especially it contains a uh, considerable amount of phytate. And then when we look at digestibility, we found that uh, digestibility ranges from study to study for about 50%. And so it uh, at the soybean meal inclusion that we use in practical diets, it can contribute some amount of, of phosphorus to the birds. And so yeah. that decreases the amount of uh, monocalcium phosphate that you have to use and can also decrease the amount of phosphorus excreted. Uh, and so improving sustainability of production as well. Sure. Uh, feed manufacturers might want, not want to hear that and decreasing the rock <laughs> phosphorus being oh, added yeah. into the diet, but... You know, um, but it's about costs and also production and also being good stewards to the environment, right? Yes. Um, and so uh, this is one step in that direction for sure. So what do you think, what are the next steps in going into this on, um, obviously, I would say more ingredients, right? Um, and then uh, looking at other minerals or other nutrients, what are your thoughts? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think we still need to... Uh, improve the database that we have on these uh, digestible phosphorus and also uh, calcium, which is a very important. Uh, currently, we use total calcium as uh, considering it's 100% digestible. We know it's probably not. Uh, 
And so by uh, think in the future, we still need to increase database and also uh, uh, look at other factors that may affect the phosphorus digestibility determination as uh, in my research, we saw that heat treatment of the feed ingredients can help increase some of the phosphorus digestibility. Uh, we also saw that uh, <clears throat> the amount of non-phytate phosphorus in the starter diet can affect the amount of uh, the digestion capacity of the birds for phytate phosphorus. Uh, and other studies have shown that also uh, the calcium to phosphorus ratio affects the phosphorus digestibility the amount of phosphorus in this test diets, the age of birds, the strain of birds. So there's still a lot of things uh, to figure out. Uh, and also I think uh, just as we've seen with amino acid digestibility that can vary from the, uh, let's say the region that the soybean meal comes from, uh, we still don't know if that also applies to phosphorus uh, and calcium and other minerals. Elevate bird well-being and improve profitability with Cargill's tailored nutrient solutions that deliver performance. Cargill is leading through applied nutrition, leveraging deep nutrient insights and understanding of the animal's nutrient requirements to achieve your production and performance goals. Well, this is really exciting, um, it, you know, data in a really exciting um, area to be looking into. And I'm... Um, I'm just looking forward to hearing more about the research that you accomplish when you're getting into your PhD. You're already um, doing some great work, and um, I really appreciate your time spending it with us today, Victor. All right. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would love to come back when I get my PhD shirt. <laughs> Well, maybe we need to check in before that. We'll see. But I do have one one final question. Um, since we are in the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt podcast, Jackie Chan or Chuck Norris? Jackie Chan. <laughs> All right. I used to watch the Jackie Chan cartoon. So <laughs> learn what Jackie Chan is. He's pretty good, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Victor. Um, looking forward to seeing your upcoming meetings and seeing your um, other research that you come up with and hopefully having you back on the show soon. And so really appreciate everyone spending time with us today and um, listening to the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt podcast. We hope to uh, hear back and listen to you all soon. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. And if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us, feel free to email the research link, uh, the paper where we can find it, or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com. That's hello at wisenetics.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.